My name is Mike Brown. I am the owner of Lava Room Recording. I have been an engineer and a producer for 20 years, and I'm a graduate from Berklee College of Music in Boston, and this is my business. I definitely work as both. Sometimes I work just as a producer. Sometimes I work just as an engineer, but usually I'm working as both. I wear both hats. Um, lots of people work with me for my production in terms of the development of their songs, but sometimes I'll work just as an engineer or just as a producer, but usually it's both. <laughs> The main difference between producer and engineer is a producer works on the development of the music, um, not just the technical side, but the arrangement of the song, the instrumentation, uh, maybe the hook or the lyrics uh, helps make the song the best it can be, whereas an engineer usually just focuses on the technical side of recording whatever is put in front of us. So... Um, producer's more creative and engineer is definitely more technical specific. Twenty five years. Yeah. Yeah. Been out of school. Oh my gosh. Twenty five years. I've been a professional 25 years. I've owned Lava Room for 20 years, but oh my goodness. I work with lots of different styles of music, but I think my favorite in general is rock alternative. It's what I listen to, what I grew up listening to. I've recorded everything from hip hop, jazz, rock, pop, country, you name it, metal. But I think um, where I really like to be is in live music, no matter what style it is, really. But I think my favorite is probably rock alternative. What do I like about my job? Well, for starters, I love my job. The reason I love my job is I get to do fun stuff every day. I get to do what I love, and every day is different. As long as the people I'm working with are cool, it doesn't matter the style of music or what I'm working on. I enjoy working with creative people. So uh, working in the studio, whether it's developing music, working on musical projects, or doing film post or advertising spots, uh, it's creative, and I do different things every day so it doesn't get redundant. So it's just fun. What do I dislike? There's a few things. I think... What I dislike about this job is when I get stuck in a situation where I'm working with some really creative musicians and there is a small budget or they don't have the budget to get from, we, they can get from point A to point B where they can get the project done. But I know if they had more money to put in the budget that we would be able to make the music so much better than what we're going to be able to do. That's a limitation. Often I'll at least try to let the artist know what the potentials are, but often when I'm working with local musicians, often there's a dedicated strict budget, so we work within our means. So if there's anything I dislike, there's a handful of things that everybody dislikes, but that's got to be the biggest setback that I can't control. So that sometimes is a bummer.
There's so many of them over the last 20 years. I think if I had to nail just one, it would have to be doing vocal tracks with Scott Weiland on the Fantastic Four soundtrack. We cut a song, geez, I don't remember what year it was, but that guy, an icon in the industry, um, he did 80 takes, one right after the other, and every one was flawless. So being able to work with that level of talent in, in a space and really see what's different between that artist being the superstar and the average musician, it was, that was a game changer for me. So being able to be part of that, one, it was really cool working on a movie soundtrack, to Scott Weiland, as crazy of a person as he was, working with that level of talent was just, was just a game changer for me. Well, I do know this, just about everybody that did these interviews, their favorite pastime was video games. Don't get me wrong, I love video games as much as the next guy. But I think if I was going to call it a pastime, I would say I spend so much time indoors in the studio that the one time to get out in nature is playing golf, where I can turn my phone off, uh, do something that I really enjoy. Between that and as I get older, I really enjoy cooking. I enjoy making meals for my family and when we have people over. So that's fun. The industry's tough now. It's so much different than it was, not even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe with streaming, it's so much harder to make money for the artists. So I have focused a lot of my time since the pandemic on really understanding how musicians survive. So I think trying to help them understand how to make money where they don't have to be reliant on signing a record deal, because a lot of musicians think that's the like that's the point of success when they reach a record deal and they don't understand really how streaming works or how to brand themselves or how to become self-sufficient or even be able to earn an income. So I think it's much harder now to be relevant in the industry and survive. <laughs> Well, one way to definitely stay relevant is I spent a lot of time during the pandemic when everything changed for everybody, trying to understand how, how streaming worked and how people got onto playlists and how they got in front of their market or their targeted audience. And I don't think musicians really have a, a good grasp on that, at least on the local side. So what I could do to help them become relevant is to understand how to reach people through social media, because that really is the epicenter of how they reach their audience and how to build a fan base, you know, how to increase in their growth and, you know, build fans in different cities. So there's a lot more to becoming successful than just recording a great record. Um, I understand the business, I understand music, and I have a background in not just the technical side of music, but also 
the music side. So when it comes to production, I have a lot to offer them in terms of development of their songs. But I make the atmosphere in here fun. I like, I don't like it to be stressful. I don't like to be stressed. So I don't like the environment to be stressful. So we have a good time. I enjoy humor, sometimes a little bit outside of the box humor, but that breaks up the stress, keeps everybody having fun. And I'm creative like they are, so I understand what they're trying to accomplish. So I think making people comfortable with working with me is what they enjoy because they become relaxed, thus they can be who they are. And we work well together as a result. Well, for starters, we've been around for 20 years. So um, that has to speak a lot about what we do here. You know, we've got great equipment, which anybody can get great equipment. Um, but in addition to that, we have great staff. We have skilled engineers and producers. Everybody that's here has been through some level of education through college, through nobody just walked in off the street and said, I'm going to be an engineer. So they had to earn their stripes, you know? So what we can offer is a comfortable atmosphere that's creative with professional quality recording and production and a place to do it that is fun. You know, it's not all just about being fun, but it's that there's no stress. You come in here, we understand what the goals are. We help you get from point A to point B and have a great experience. We rely on that for, you know, new clients coming in, knowing that other people that have worked here, they've heard about us and that's why they come. Sometimes during a session, clients will have off days and I have off days, you know, I understand um, we're, we're working in a creative environment. So sometimes when we're working on projects, maybe you're just not having your best day. And when I'm working on this side of the glass, I try to help people accomplish what they're here to do. So when they're having an off day. Sometimes it might be mental, trying to get past that tough note or that tough melody part or hard part to play on an instrument. And that can be frustrating when I can only give them guidance, but I can't do it for them. So I can provide as much support as I can, but sometimes we just don't get it. And when we don't get it, I can, I can feel their frustration because I'm frustrated because I'm here to help. And when that happens, you know, it's, there's nothing that can, we could do. So I just tell them it's, this is, we just cut it. It's the end of the day. We'll start fresh tomorrow. And, but that's frustrating because it happens and people don't have control over it. What can be so amazing is when we're working with creative people and it's mostly in music that I, I would say this pertains to, but anybody that's creative, when you see a level of talent live and not just a recording, I'm seeing it through this side of the glass. They're out in a performance room or a vocal booth and they sing that perfect take or they play that perfect solo or the groove on the drums is just so in the pocket. That is indescribable because there's like an, an energy or an emotion in the room that sometimes translates to a recording. But when you see it happen or when the people are working together and they're developing a song, and there's creative minds working. And a lot of times I'm on the production side of the development of that. So I'm part of it. 
but having all of that come together and then you hear the finished product and then it, there's just so much involved in the emotional side of creating that it's a form of art i think that's pretty indescribable for me Initially, I had a thought for this question, and it was going to be Prince. And one of the other guys had named Prince, and, and Prince was my first for sure. But I, I wanted to think about this because I think this is a fun question, but my answer is going to have to be a guy named Bob Clearmountain. He was, is a producer, Grammy Award winning mix engineer. When I was in college, I got the chance to meet him accidentally. I was at a convention in New York right after a hit song came out called Sonny Came Home. And I remember hearing that song and listening to it and just being blown away by his choice of simplicity on some of the instrumentation in the production. And at that moment, I thought, man, I want to be that guy. And I was in New York at an AES convention, and that was my second time there. AES convention is like NAM for musicians, but for audio nerds like myself. And all the producers, engineers from all over the world were at this tech show. And I was standing in line to get a piece of pizza from a Sabaro. And I was talking with some friends and I accidentally bumped into this guy as I was turning around and I knocked his pizza out of his hand onto the floor. And when he stood up, it was Bob Clearmountain. And I didn't know what to say because this guy had been my idol from school. And I was like, I'm sorry. And he was friendly and nice. And I didn't get to ask him anything except I paid for another piece of pizza. So at that point, the regret of going, this superstar is in front of me. I could ask him anything. He's just a regular guy, nice guy. And I missed it. But future projects went on and I listened to his music and I just diagnosed his science of audio and learned so much from him that I would love to be able to sit down and have a conversation with him of how he got to where he's at and, you know, just pick his brain on what makes, what makes things work. Cause he's very, very successful, but he's a regular guy. And I think that would be a, a unbelievable opportunity. No, definitely not. Never. I, I recognize when I'm doing stuff well or successful, but I, um, I strive for perfection on whatever I do. And often I just second guess and redo and do again and do over and think about what I'm listening to and I'll hear it and I'll go, you know what? I want to make one more change. I'm going to try this one more time or I'm going to change this. And I think one of the one of the things that became a very important important very important part of how I do things is I'm always learning. So I'm constantly reading about new technology and everything else and trying to be better. And when you get to a point if you think you're the best or you're great or whatever other younger guys just come and pass you by. So I think not being satisfied with the work that I do challenges myself and pushes me to be better all the time. And I want to be better for me, but I also want to be better for my clients and for the people that I work with. But I have a hard time listening to things and going, yeah, I nailed it. I listen to it and I go, it's good, but could it be better? And then I'll listen to it months later and I'll go, that's pretty good. 
And then sometimes I'll listen to something else months later and I'll go, I suck. I could be better, but it's, it's a slippery slope. So I think it's good to keep yourself challenged. So I'm, I like, I wish I was happier with my stuff, but um, right now I just, I look at it as every day is a challenge. I could name a bunch of things, but the one thing that makes me crazy in a recording session is when I'm working with a vocalist, um, it doesn't matter what, what level degree of talent, but when they bring in a lyric sheet makes me absolutely crazy because the way that the brain works is when you're reading lyrics, part of your brain is reading. So it's using some of its resources to read the lyrics and you're not giving a hundred percent emotion into your performance. And I think the average person that listens to a song, what makes them decide whether or not they like it is, is it genuine? Is it real? And if somebody's reading their lyrics off a lyric sheet, I don't think they can be 100% real. So I, I try to get people to memorize that stuff beforehand. Some people have trouble with it, so I understand. But that still makes me crazy because I know, or I may never know what the full potential of a song would be because they're reading off a lyric sheet. So that makes me absolutely nuts. No, I never have. I, I was a musician when I was a younger kid. And I remember being at what they call, they call them clinics back in the day in music stores. I remember being at a clinic with a drummer who was the drummer for uh, Vinnie Vincent. He was a guitar player for Kiss for a short time. And then he started a band in the 80s, early 90s. No, I think it was 80s called the Vinnie Vincent Invasion. His name was Bobby Rock. Guy was built like a monster, just huge athletic build. And he hit the drums like he was trying to kill him. And somebody asked a question during this clinic, and they said, did you ever have anything else to fall back on besides music? And he said, people that have a plan B or something to fall back on eventually will. And that resonated with me where not to just not have a, a dedicated plan, but I wanted to put a hundred percent of my focus into being in the entertainment industry, in the music industry, recording industry. So I, I think when I found what my thing was, which was music, I just stuck with it. And I had worked other jobs before I got to this point, but it was until I was able to really go to college and learn technical engineering and production. And then this is all I've ever done. So I, I don't think I ever really considered another career path. So, yeah. <laughs> Indeed, there was. This would have to be 1984, 85, somewhere in there. I was a 14-year-old kid, and I had experienced MTV. The very first time I came home from school and there was a video on, it was at the time it was called Heavy Metal Half Hour, 30 minutes of just... MTV used to just have mostly like pop rock videos at that time. But then there was a half hour every day where it was heavy metal. And I remember seeing this video where I'm watching this guitar player playing the video as rain is coming down on all their instruments and the cameras flying all over the place. And I'm watching this guy play and I'm going, 
looking at that going, that is the most amazing thing I've ever seen. And I'm picturing myself on a stage playing like that guy's playing. And at that moment, I was like, this is what I want to do. Now, at that time, I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be a rock star. And I slightly deviated from my plan being a producer and engineer. Um, but I'm still in the same industry. And that moment of MTV exposed me to music, exposed me to the industry, and set my career path. Um, and that was the beginning of everything. So I, I would have to say, I will remember that moment forever. Just sitting down, watching that and going, this is it. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. That's who I'm going to be. I wasn't quite that guy. I'm this guy. But I got there. That's a tough question. I want, I want to continue what I'm doing, but I want to be better. So what is better? Better is probably growing my business. There's so much more that can happen. We're in the city of Cleveland. So there's so much more that can happen with the music industry here that I really want to, to be a part of, and maybe even be the developer as that grows. But I think if I'm trying to picture where I see myself in 10 years, it would be still being in the recording industry for sure. Everybody wants a hit record. So that, that's been on my list for 20 years. So that would be wonderful. That used to be my main goal. Not, it's not anymore. It's, it's such a small thing compared to the grand scheme of what we do here, what I do. But I would like to see the business grow, be more involved in the educational part of what we do here in audio industry. Um, but really see more success with music and artists that we work with directly here, not just work with people as they're traveling through Cleveland, because we've worked with a lot of big stars. I've worked with a lot of people over the last 20 years. But I think being able to create and develop them from, from the start, uh, I think that's, that's where I have the most fun. And to be able to see somebody really go from here to the moon. I think that would be wonderful. So I see myself and my staff going that direction. That's where we're headed. That's where we're going. So I think that's where I see myself in 10 years. Yeah.